without further ado, going to introduce uh, Kate Winslet. had to project. Um, I, I could have started out by listing, you know, all of the films in your filmography. You know, it's been kind of amazing watching the variety of films you've been in. Uh, but just to start with, I just want to welcome you back to the New York Film Festival because this is, I think, the fourth or fifth film you, you've had here. You've been here with Little Children yep. um, and also Carnage yes. uh, and Steve Jobs, of course, and, and now uh, Wonder Wheel. Yep. So, and among those, we had an opening night film, a centerpiece film, <laughs> and a closing night film. So we're probably going to have to invent a new event for okay. the next film <laughs> that you do. I'm up for that. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, you know, with with Wonder Wheel, uh, it's uh, I guess we just I'm just curious, you know, how you got started with a project uh, like that because it just seems, in many ways, uh, you know, tailor made for many of the challenges you like to meet as an actor, um, and if, you know, complex role and how it develops over, over, over the course of time. And there's like a cinematic aspect, but also kind of a stage or theatrical aspect in the way he's filming it. Um, so, I mean, when did you first read the script for that or when, you know? So, um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, so, uh, it was last summer and and my agent phoned and said, okay, Woody Allen wants to talk to you. Right? <laughs> and um, he's going to send you a script, and he wants you for the lead, but he wants to talk to you. Right. <laughs> anything else? Nope. <laughs> she didn't know anything else. So I sort of immediately went into, oh, hi, sorry, I've just seen people I know, hi. <laughs> I, I sort of immediately went into this state of, you know, de definite sort of panic, but incredible um, excitement and fear and trepidation and anticipation and all of those things that you would feel if someone told you that Woody Allen was about to phone you up. So I, s I, I had to wait for the phone to ring, which it did. Hello? <laughs> Woody on the end of the phone. Oh, hi, this is Kate. Hello. How are you? <laughs> um, I'm fine. How are you? And already I'm thinking, you are so not being yourself at all on this phone call, Kate. You are just, you're doing an invented version of who you are because you're so terrified already that he's not actually going to give you the part that apparently he's already given you. <laughs> and so... I just was, I was not myself. It was, it was, I felt like I was giving a bad telephone audition. Anyway, he, he said these extraordinary things. He said, well, I have a script that I, I, I wrote and I, I, I very much thought of you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're probably going to hate it, but, uh, you know, and if you don't want to do it, you can just go on and have a more fulfilling life. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I, I, I really, I think it could be a tour de force for you. And, and I think you should, you know, I think I, I think you should, you know, have a read and you know, you're probably gonna hate it, said it again. You know, so it goes on like this. Can we hear the, the whole conversation? <laughs> this really was the whole conversation. <laughs> and I was thrilled to discover that actually I was just laughing. I just ended up laughing. I said, okay, well, uh, well I'll read it. Well, they're gonna get it to you. I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't know how they're gonna get it to you, but someone's gonna get it to you. And, and you, you know, you know you'll, you'll read it. And, you know. <laughs> and we can change everything, you know? And I'm thinking, no, that's definitely made up. That is definitely <laughs> the bit I don't believe. Um, and so then somebody, a proper carrier pigeon person came to my house with the script. And I said, okay, um, well, would you like a coffee <laughs> while you sit on the step <laughs> and wait? Said, yes, okay, yeah, that would be nice. I'm like, oh, my God, someone's actually waiting outside the door. And so I sat on the stairs at home and, and read the script and, um, and sort of couldn't move, really. And I'm actually quite a fairly slow reader. I don't read books or scripts quickly at all. Um, and I just sat there and was... Um, I mean, I was really so stunned 
by this character and this incredible film that he had written. And I promise you, I said out loud, oh, well, I can't do that. I mean, I, can't, I, just, I, well, I, just, I just can't. It's, and my husband said, what's it like? I said, well, it's absolutely brilliant, but I just, I, I just can't. I just forget it. I just, I just I can't do it. So just please don't even look at me and just please just, just don't look at me like that. I'm not doing it. I cannot do it. I can't do it. What are you talking about? I can't play this part. It's too, I can't. I, I don't know how to. I, don't, I, I just don't know how to. And I really thought I didn't know how to play this part. What, what was it that you were, we weren't able to get, a, get your hands around somehow? So Ginny is, well, she's, she's nothing like me, but that's not really the thing because, of course, when a character isn't anything like you, that's the exact reason why you should think, oh, well, maybe I should give it a go because that's what acting is. But she felt so far out of my grasp. Um, she felt so far away and... Um, Incre com complex ish isn't even a word I think I could use because she is those things, but it's it's a, l a lot of confusion with her and this you know she's living a, living a life that is so full of sort of not shattered dreams but proper mistakes that really made a difference to the course of her life and all of her choices. She has no choice. You know, one day she did, and now she doesn't. And to play this character who throws it all the way, all away, at the at the possible chance or the hope of something new somewhere else, but it's an impossible, unreachable, ungraspable fantasy. And to play a woman like that, who also drinks and shouts and has a son who s lights fires, you know, that to to uh, and has a different accent to me, you know, I I, I just I just thought to myself, well. I just don't know where to begin. And then I, I looked at myself in the mirror and just went, oh, for fuck's sake, get your act together. Of course you've got to do it. I've got, just shut up, shut up, Kate, just shut up. Of course you've got to do it. And so I did. Um, <laughs> but I think we were all really terrified, actually. You know, I think, I think the idea of working with Woody Allen, it's so thrilling. You know, I've been, I've been aware of him for as long as I wanted to be an actress, you know, and my parents were so proud, the idea that I would work with him. And uh, and that was a really big deal for me as well. Yeah, and <coughs> so there there hadn't been any period before that y you'd ever been offered a role in, in a Woody Allen a Woody Allen movie. This is really the first time, or no? I had had there was there was a moment actually when I I had actually met him twice before for different films. One I can't even remember what the film was. I don't think I was ever even told. Um, but I didn't get the part. <laughs> I remember skipping. Uh, sk <laughs> no, <laughs> I remember skipping across. Um, Fifth Avenue, I was here doing some press for, I think, probably even Heavenly Creatures or something like that. And um, I was going to meet Woody Allen. Well, I mean, I was nearly sick, the idea of it. And I walked in and he just went, mm hmm, okay, very nice, thank you. <laughs> and I thought, well, like that, I'm never going to work with him. Obviously, he hates me. And, um, and then I did meet him again um, for a different film, which for a minute I was actually going to do. And then, but I had just had a baby, my, my son Joe, who's now 14, and just my family life just actually it wasn't possible. So, so I'm very, very lucky that I, I, I got another go around. Yeah. And I mean, it's such a wonderful part that you can really dig into. It's a real showcase. And I kind of in a literal way, it's a showcase because what was fascinating to me is that the home, you know, where you where you live with with your husband in the in the film, it's it's like a stage, you know. Uh, I mean, uh, how how that probably was interesting for you as an actor that you have a character who's kind of aware of herself playing a part. She even says a lot of points, you know, I'm just playing a role. I'm not really this person. It well, that's another reason why she was so difficult because I think that every single step of every step she took, every breath she took, and every moment of her life, she just w kept thinking, "This, this is not, this isn't really me. <laughs> this just isn't me." And yet, the tragic thing, of course, is that it absolutely is her, and it's what she's made her, her life, and that that's it. Um, and she can't blame anyone else for it. Um, but that set, actually, the the set where we hum, Humpty and and um, Ginny's apartment, um, it was it was extraordinary, and it was a little bit like being on a stage. I remember when Jim and I, Jim, do you remember we when we first walked in, we we thought, oh no, there's too many things in the way, and we even tried to get the set director to like chop off a bit of the kitchen counter, <laughs> didn't we, Jim? 
<laughs> and, we, yeah. oh, wow. and we and 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 I, and I sort of couldn't bl- i was like what, what are we doing woody's gonna absolutely kill us they said no no no, he'll probably be fine about it and we thought oh okay well well can we actually chop that bit of the kitchen counter off then because like there should be more of a thoroughfare here and there's too many things in the way duh come in the next day Woody deliberately wants there to be all these obstructions. Well, of course he did, you know, and it was perfect like that. And it did mean that there's so much walking around of that kitchen counter and the chairs in the way and the table and that, you know, just it, it added to the chaos of of, of the, the mess of life and her desperately trying to get out of it. Um, but it was, it was, um, it was a great set, actually. It yeah. was. Yeah, I mean, and, and also, of course, you have the cinematographer, Vittorio Storaro, you know, uh, yeah. a real master working there. And he comes up with all these elaborate ways of maneuvering you uh, and Jim Belushi through the whole set. That's also, I mean, that's something that must have required a lot of elaborate kind of blocking rehearsal just to get that sort of stuff done. Or? Oh, my God. So there's this thing that is n- apparently known about Woody Allen, which is that he doesn't rehearse and that he really doesn't talk to the actors much. Both of those things are not true. <laughs> he absolutely rehearses so what we would do is we would go in in the morning and we would get hair and makeup camera ready all of us all the cast and then Woody would would arrive so and then he could see his actors he never saw me I don't, I'm sure probably everyone else as well but he never saw me without my full costume and wig on never not once on the whole shoot and I actually wanted it to be that way so it was great um, so then we would all go onto the set and we would we would absolutely rehearse the living daylights out of the scene. So it could be a 14 page scene and the entire thing would be incredibly choreographed, you know, really thought through. And and also there would be problem areas. So suddenly he might cut a piece of dialogue and we would all go away while he thought about that. And then we'd come back and he'd say, actually, actually it wasn't so bad. I just trimmed a little here and there. <laughs> but then there were other days when actually he would slash an entire scene in half. There was a scene with Justin and myself in these Chinese gardens and, um, <laughs> and we were rehearsing the scene and we're in the middle of the rehearsal <laughs> and Woody <laughs> just sort of started shuffling off and we were still acting we're like Woody he's like oh you're still talking you're not still talking is this is, isn't it done we're like no Woody there's like a whole other like three and a half pages <laughs> of your scene that you wrote oh this is too long oh no this is oh no I gotta fix this you're still talking? <laughs> oh no, I, we gotta go to lunch. I gotta fix this. And then he slashed this scene in half, which gave me a full on heart attack. Justin Timberlake, no heart attack at all because he has this memory for dialogue that is absolutely infuriating. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Woody would do things like that. So we would always be hair and makeup ready. We would rehearse really with everybody. So it became very much a piece of theater and was something that included you know the camera guys we had lots of steady cam happening so that involved a lot of hiding of wires and pinning down pieces of carpet so people didn't trip and you know this is the setting of props you know all of these kinds of things that you have to really make sure you know is my whiskey bottle in the same place the cigarettes where's the cigarettes the ashtray oh that's moved wait the knife the thing the chopping the laundry basket the, you know the, it, and so lots and lots of rehearsal and he did you know i would say that for for all of us and cer- certainly this was the case for me it was the most purely sort of actor-director relationship I think I've ever had. You know, there were no lunches and dinners and there was none of that social, there was none of that at all. There was none of that, oh, would you like to come for Sunday lunch? It was absolutely very much a business-like thing. And I really liked that because often for me, I find myself wanting to truly make sure that the director, I don't know, feels included with the actors in some way because often they're off doing other things and so, you know, normally it's me who's saying, oh, let's do a Sunday lunch or let's do a, you know, why don't we all go for a cocktail on Saturday night? And, and actually it was really nice just not to be that person, not to be the party planner and just to, um, just to focus on the job. I mean, there was, there was no other way around it really because there was so much dialogue. Yeah, I mean, you have all these the kind of set piece m- monologues that are just great that you can really just tear, tear into. And a lot of them are really interesting because you go through a whole gamut of emotions within the space of a minute. Uh, you know, I think there's, 
or, or even in dialogue with, with uh, you know, Juno Temple at one point, you go from when you're questioning her about her seeing uh, Justin Timberlake's character, uh, and you go from just kind of being suspicious, uh, and then you get, you know, th then you get kind of concerned, you pretend to be concerned for a second, uh, and, and then you kind of, you know, get angry again. Uh, so you're able to phase through all these things. It's, it's a character, isn't it a character who's kind of always has all of the feelings at once <laughs> that she about, you know, the past and the present? That's exactly right. I mean, she, you know, Woody had just written in to every scene that Ginny was in <clears throat> the most extraordinary range of emotions. It was never, ever just one thing. You know, it's never, it's never just the sad scene or the angry scene or the drunk scene. It was all of those things and about 10 more other things as well. Um, and I did find that, I found it was a real balancing act because, of course, you know, I mean, like even the, tr the choice of dialect that I did for her you know, I absolutely could have been that girl. I could have spoken like that and I could have laid it on thick, you know, and I could have done that thing that we've seen done before. And I just didn't want to do it. I wanted to find another way of making her a whole and proper person that I had never seen before, let alone played before. And so establishing even the dialect was something that... Actually, Woody was really good about this because I thought, oh, he's not going to want me to send him a tape of me, you know, doing some of Ginny's lines or something. But I, I sort of said, look, I'm going to have to know if I'm doing something shit or something <laughs> that you like. Because if I get there on day one and you say, oh, this you know, dialect is awful, then I'm going to have a heart attack. So, so my dialect coach, um, Susan and I, who I've worked with for 20 years, um, we sat down and we we just found something that sounded as though it was from a sort of a broader New York -y area, which is what Woody had talked about, not specifically Coney Island, and that she had been somewhat educated at some point in her life. She there had been some education of sorts, and perhaps a bit of proper theatre training. So, so that meant that <coughs> we had quite a lot to play with actually, and we did record a piece of dialogue into my iPhone and sent it to Woody. And it was like waiting, I don't know what it was like waiting, but it was like waiting to know whether Father Christmas was actually gonna bring me a present or not. And, and, and luckily he sent an email saying, yeah, very nice, very nice. <laughs> Something like that, you've done a nice job. I thought, okay, I'm in, right. so I'm in, <laughs> he likes me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it's obviously territory that he knows pretty well, just, you know, even just geographically, the, the general, I, is, I mean, is it in, in Annie Hall where they live, you know, the, the kid lives right next to the cyclone, I felt like, yeah. you know, living right next to the Wonder Wheel is like the equivalent for this movie of that. Well, can you imagine, you know, living next to the Wonder Wheel, living above that shooting alley, you know, the constant, constant noise. So Ginny, you know, she's a woman who can just never, ever escape, can't escape anything at all and um just the words you know it's just so much to say you know we were, we would all run lines we'd share these rides home in the evening and we would all you know be grateful when there was traffic because it meant that we have more time running lines for the next day and the next day and the next week you know and we would just end it was it was honestly it was a real immersive you know diligent committed it was it was it was very different it was very different to any other film there was you know i haven't done many films that have been quite as immersive like that maybe the reader was like that i think perhaps and um little children was a bit like that just because it was difficult a difficult story oh no revolution road was a bit like that too <laughs> um, <laughs> but um but that proper just completely round the clock and i would sleep um in these sort of hour-long bursts and I would wake up and go is it now is it now is it now no it's not now partly excitement about going to work and shooting these great scenes but also partly fear also you know just terror that I'd miss the alarm you know and I would and I would uh, my hands would hurt in the night and I think what my, why are my hands hurting and then I'd fall asleep and then I'd wake up again is it now is it now and I'd realize I was clenching my fists and I was sleeping with these clenched fists I've never done that before it was very weird yeah I don't do it now <laughs> but I did do it then. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's 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 a character. It's it's almost hard hard to leave behind. I mean, she's just this constant frenetic kind of ball of energy. Um, I also just want to go go back a bit to the the cinematography because mm. that's another way that all your emotions are kind of heightened. You know, mm. these amazing scenes where you have they put these gel lights on you, so you'll go from like red to to blue in in a scene, 
and and or they'll just kind of turn off all the colors you know when you're kind of getting in this very contemplative state in the film uh, I mean how, how do you respond to that when, you know as, as an actor is it, is it is it distracting to have to, to work with it or how do you integrate that with your own expression well I try I mean one thing that I've always tried to do is to not pay too much attention actually and uh, in uh, for a good reason so you try not to notice too much the specifics of what the cinematographer is actually doing with the lights because because it can often make you you know in reality it can it can make you a bit self-conscious when you think oh well what's he why why is he lighting me from down there or up there or what's you know i just would rather not think about it and just totally trust and of course it's vittorio storaro you know um but i was definitely aware of walking onto the set when he had done his lighting for the day because it would all be established and then we'd go and every day i would walk in and go oh my god it's beautiful in here and i would s i would really see this just painting. And I remember he did the funniest thing once to Jim. I don't know if you even remember him saying this, Jim. But so Jim was trying to establish what the framing was for a certain shot. And it was always very difficult to know what the framing was because everything was a lot, a, most of our scenes were done all in one long continuous take. But sometimes they would move in slightly closer and you'd have to, you know, get out the way of the camera so the next actor could literally step into the frame and it was very confusing. But Jim said to um, Vittorio, Vittorio, um, uh, where, are you, where are you framing this? And, uh, and Vittorio said, it's from the waist, just the waist. So it's only your, um, from the waist up. And then he turned around and he said, <laughs> you are just like Marlon. <laughs> you only act... You only want to act with the part of the body that the camera can see. And I was like, no. And even I, s I said, no, no, that's not why he's asking. I said, that's not why I immediately felt very defensive. But then, I, but then I sort of sat back and thought, wow, that's a story to tell. You were just like Marlon. It's like, oh my God, who are we working with? And every day, every day, I would, I would, I would look at him and think, wow, you, you really are Vittorio Storaro. And, and what? <laughs> How are we all here? I mean, it was it was really something. Yeah. It was really, really, truly something. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's. I mean, and the, the whole movie has such a great progression to it as, as, as well b between the lighting and, and between your own development of the character. I mean, um, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't know if people have seen it yet in this room. No, not yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a nice development to the character, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but there's so many scenes where I'm kind of wondering what's going going through your, your head as, you know, even just that monologue uh, on, in the boardwalk with, with, uh, with uh, Justin Timberlake in the beginning, you know, where you're kind of, you, you're like, you have, I have two things I need to tell you about it, you know, and I mean, how do you get into the, to the mind, I don't think that's too much of a spoiler to say that they talk on the yeah. boardwalk because the movie's set in Coney Island, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what's going through your, through your mind in, in trying, to, in, in getting that scene across? <laughs> well, when I tell you the direction that Woody gave, <laughs> which luckily made me laugh, thank God, thank God. And also, thank God I'm just so old now that I don't seem to get, you know, offended particularly anymore. <laughs> when I certainly I'm afraid. did when I was younger. Oh my God, when we were shooting that scene, this is really true, when we were shooting that scene, Woody got up out of his chair and he does this thing where he just sort of shuffles and he was like, oh. Stop. <laughs> oh my God, he's going to die. And I said, what's the matter? He said, it's just too actressy. Ouch. <laughs> no, but I honestly, and thank God Justin was there because he's a little bit the same and doesn't get offended. So luckily I cracked up laughing. I said, did you actually just say that? He was like, well, it was. I said, well, okay. Um, is that a piece of direction? He said, well, no, I know. Uh, would you like me to show you how I would do it? <laughs> At which point, Kate Winslet says, yes, definitely. <laughs> so, and then Woody would do it. And, and I would just sort of just want him to do it so I could watch him <laughs> do it. <see? laughs> so I would just kind of go, wow, he's really just acting out his own scenes right in front of my very eyes. <laughs> And then, and then I would have to somehow de eyes his version and make it my own. <laughs> but I would get a hell of a kick out of that. Would you like me to show you how I would do it? That would come up quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> now I just imagine like every senior, like, can you just show us how to do this? Yeah. <laughs> no, but there were ti- there were also times when I really would. That there's a scene. There's a, a scene in the movie where my character Ginny gives Justin's character Mickey a pocket watch, and it's a very very difficult, very difficult scene. I think it's probably one of the hardest scenes I've ever had to grapple with. Um, yeah, actually. It's a great, yeah, it's a great scene. It's a difficult scene. <laughs> and um, and I went to Woody at the beginning of that day and I said, okay, I just really need you to help me today. <gasps> well, okay. And I'd say, well, it, is anything the matter? And I'd say, no, it's just the scene, Woody. It's just a very difficult scene. And I, you know, I just don't want to, I just really don't want to fuck it up. <laughs> I just want to get it right. And he said, okay, okay, well, I'll, I'll be there for you. And then he w- really would be, you know, he really, he really, really would be. Um, and the same with the very final scene, because I was a little bit nervous about treading on ground that had been trodden on before with certain female characters in other movies because it's a sort of a crescendo type of a scene. And I just wanted it to be, I wanted to make it my own, quite honestly. I just wanted to make it my own my own thing. Um, and I said the same thing, Tim, then I went up to him and I said, I want you to really, you gotta get me through this one. And I said, okay. And then he did. Yeah. Yeah. It was really quite, I was surprised by that actually. Because I had been told that he was quite awkward with actors, <laughs> which he is. <laughs> but, <laughs> but awkward in a good way. <laughs> but when when prodded, you know, he sort of, he, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I read somewhere in an, in an interview uh, that uh, one thing that attracts you about a role is that you, are, you have to expose something about yourself, in, uh, you know, in it. Uh, I'm curious what, I mean, it seems weird. How did you expose yourself? But, <laughs> but in this role, what, what, you know, what, what did you feel you were able to make vulnerable or, or that was a new challenge for you in this role? I think that I think that <laughs> there were lots of things about her that were that that were challenging, but I think because she 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 says how she feels and tries desperately to articulate what she's feeling so much of the time that actually when you have a character like that, it can get really big and it can get a bit indulgent and 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 because that's the nature of her world, you know and and she's very much articulating literally everything around her, you know, from, you know, I feel like shit, my clothes, you know, everything, I've got to wash my uniform, I've got to, where's Richie, where's, you know, what do you mean we haven't got any money? What do you mean clean the fish? I've got a headache. I mean, it was, it's a constant sort of slew of, of her just describing w- what she's going through. And that can get neurotic and it can just go the wrong side of the line. So I was constantly, constantly just checking myself to make sure I was keeping it you know, my side of the line and not letting her get honestly out of control because also towards the story, she does get a little out of control. Um, and you have to earn that as an actor. You know, you can't have those great scenes and not earn the right to play them. Um, and so the whole film really up to those final scenes was for me very much about earning it. Um, and not um, also trying not to sort of give too much away too soon about all of those things. Um, but I would honestly, I would have days and I'd turn to Susan, my dialect coach who was in this room and I just saw her briefly over there. Um, but I would turn to Susan and I'd say, look, just tell me the truth. Is this like, am I giving a performance that is something like a bad school production? Because I'm sure that I'm just, I just feel like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I would have days when I felt like I was just free falling. Um, and I definitely have felt like that a lot before, but I really felt like that, I think, every day on this. And that came from a place of just desperately wanting to really get it right and the terrible fear that that um, I might not. <laughs> well, my, hum- my humble opinion it did, but... <laughs> um, but uh, you never know, though. You just <laughs> never know. Yeah. Um, I also just wanted to talk uh, about some other films in, in, in your career. And, and, and uh, one film that comes to m- came to mind a little bit in, in uh, preparing... Uh, was Mildred Pierce, um, just because you know you it's you touch on some of the same uh, themes, uh, just in terms of a, a woman at, at a crossroads or a number of crossroads, and 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 uh, kind of having to fight for her independence uh, in, in, a, in a very visceral way. Um, and I, I don't know. I wonder if when you when you're preparing a new role, how do you is, or does a past role like that ever come to your mind, or do you kind of put things in a box when you're done and and then move, move on, or, or or can you draw on past characters like that? No, I never, never 
do that. I never draw on past characters um, really at all. I mean, it's sort of a kind of a rule that I make with myself. Um, and I think until I had children, my eldest is now 17 as of yesterday, um, but until I had children, I could, I could sort of carry on being the character even after the filming had stopped and even after we'd wrapped and I would sort of almost indulge in the experience I had just had and I would talk it through with friends and I would let it go. Now there's no time, it's like, okay, okay, school run, pack lunches, off we go, okay, uh, just do the lines in the car. And, and actually, um, when getting ready for Wonder Wheel, anyone who could read <laughs> became a script reading buddy. So my, my son Joe, I remember being on paddle, a paddleboard with him and he would say, right, mum, scene 52, Mickey and Ginny under the boardwalk, go. And he had mem he'd, uh, he'd done it with me so many times that he had memorized it as well. <laughs> so it became a sort of a total family experience actually, this film in particular. Um, but you know, certainly one thing that I, that I do find very useful on occasion is often playing a character who is from a particular period in time. Certainly with the American roles that I've played, like with Revolutionary Road, for example, you know, this was set at the same time period, obviously completely different characters from totally different worlds. But actually, just the fact that I had, ex I had occupied that period in time in a character before, I actually did find quite useful. Um, and I, and it, was, it was just bliss, actually, on this, just doing lots of, pi it was lots of picture reference, really, and music, because I knew that that was a big, important thing for Woody. And he references the music choices quite a lot through the script, which not very many directors do. But of course, because he's a musician and because rhythm is so, he's unbelievable with ry rhythm. Um, so when a scene is too long, that's why he's just like, no, we've got to stop, this is not, he can feel it. Um, but I did so. So there was a lot. I listened to a lot of music getting getting ready for this. Actually, yeah. I mean, it, they have this Coney Island blues song that yeah. kind of runs through the whole film. Mm -hmm. And then there's one great moment late in the film where you really vividly hear one line of lyrics: "Don't pity me," you know. And mm -hmm. it's at this one of these really poignant moments. Yeah, but it does. You know, it's acting is such a wonderful, wonderful job, and I love it. I love it, and I love making films. And it still is the most exciting thing in the world to have that alarm clock go off at, you know, 40, 45 a.m. Knowing that I'm going to work and I feel like I've got a secret. And I, st I really still truly feel that way. And um, actually, for me, the, the, that's the best bit is the filming. And the, the, the hard bit is, is all the getting ready. Because so much of that involves sort of <laughs> actually cooking quite a lot. <laughs> so if, <I'm laughs> if I find myself, you know, just thinking, oh God, I can't, I just, I still not, don't quite know how to play this person yet. And those scenes I thought I was going to think about today, well, I'll just make some more soup. So then I'll just <laughs> sort of, <laughs> endless freezing of soup goes on. Secrets of Oscar winners. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, this, pr pr procrast <laughs> this procrastinating, you know, thing that I sometimes do. And actually I really did that on the reader. So oh, yeah. that because I was so, lots of soup. <laughs> Mildred chopping up chicken. <laughs> Freezer full of chicken for practice, um, <laughs> but um, clam house in this one. <laughs> oh my god! Um, but but the reader, I well, I after reading the book over and over again, which seemed to me to be the one thing that I could do to make myself feel as though it was going to be okay playing that part, and then as soon as I had to really accept that I couldn't play her if I didn't truly understand the role of an SS guard that's when you enter the world of seeing the things that you never want to ever see again. And playing a character who I really just didn't like. You know, that, that was, uh, and similarly with Ginny, I, oh, oh my God, I wanted to kill her, you know. And, and, and Diane Dreyer, who was our script supervisor, well, on, on my rap day, she was the first, she, I saw her, she threw her clipboard to one side, and it was my final shot, and the first AD said, okay, everyone, that's a wrap on Kate. She threw her clipboard, she came, she grabbed me and she went, let her go, for God's sake, just let her go. <laughs> and I burst into tears, wh which was com a complete surprise. But she sort of had kind of occupied um, this space in me that was just bleh. <laughs> you know? yeah. But you know, but I do still love it. I do, I do still really, I really love it. What, what, what's, what's, what's the character you're most fond of? Clementine, I think. Yeah. I have to say, I think Clementine in Eternal Sunshine. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, she's one I'd love to play again okay. because it was s just so much fun and the possibilities with and the hair colors were just endless. <laughs> I mean, 
wouldn't you like to see Clementine as a 42-year-old woman? I'd love to know what happened to her. You know, I love the idea that she just let herself get really fat and, you know, just 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 totally, you know, let go of her hang-ups about her body and just indulged in everything that made her feel happy, you know, <laughs> and more hair colors and more crazy clothes. Um, I just think that could have been that could have been fun. Yeah, Eternal Sunshine too. Um, uh, and I mean, I, I was also watching, wondering what other films you've done that maybe you, you feel are sort of overlooked. Um, I, I mean, I always felt like Romance and Cigarettes is just a lot of fun and was sort of maybe, you know, could have gotten more attention. But. I taped my boobs into a bra on that shoot. <laughs> That's how mad that shoot was. Like, I had just had my son, Joe. He was only 12 weeks old. And I said to John Turturro, John, please please, please don't hold me to this. Please don't make me do this film because I've just had a baby. And he was like, so is Mary Louise. And I was like, oh. <laughs> okay. He was like, look, you can pump together, which we actually <laughs> did. <laughs> very sensitive to but, but I had a dance scene. I had a dance scene with Jimmy Gandolfini. Oh, I had a dance scene with Jimmy. And, um, and I had, hadn't fed my baby for about six hours. And I do remember looking in the mirror and just thinking, should I pump now <laughs> or should I pump after the scene? <laughs> and because I was playing this woman who was very kind of blousy and brazen and, and, and curvaceous and vivacious and all of those things, I just thought, oh, sod it, I'll just pump after the scene. And so, but then I had to tape myself physically into my bra because that would have not been pretty. <laughs> but that, yeah. <laughs> So outtakes. Right? <laughs> Inside. <Okay. laughs> Inside the actor's den. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're really, we're really getting to the nitty gritty here. Of all, yeah, that's, that's good. Don't start me because I am terrible and I would tell you things <laughs> that people would just roll their eyes and scream at me. <laughs> Why did you tell them that story? <laughs> <laughs> now i got to figure out what those stories are. Um, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Um, and I mean, romance and cigarettes, and then, I mean, there's just a whole s uh, string of films. Uh, oh, so so actually, yes. Yeah, sorry, I didn't answer your very important, intelligent question, which was, have any of my films been overlooked? <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's a weird one. That is a weird one to answer because I only ever see the things that I'm in once, and then I don't ever see them again. And so it's really weird because I don't. Um, some of them, I actually, I mean, like I think of hideous, kinky. I actually can't really remember the beginning, the middle, and the end. Um, but. I will tell this story. So, not last Christmas, but the Christmas before. Was it Neddy, last Christmas before? We were in New Zealand? It was, wasn't it? And we saw Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh. And Peter said, when did you last see Heavenly Creatures? And I said, oh my God. I mean, truly years ago. And, uh, and my daughter, <coughs> who was 15 at the time, said, oh, can we see it, Mum? can we see it? I said, no, you're too young. She went, Mum. You were 17 when you made the film. I, I was like, oh my God, that moment's happening right now when my own daughter is almost the age. So I suddenly realized, my God, we can sit down. We could sit down with them and watch Heavenly Creatures. And so we did. So Peter and I and my husband, Ned, and Mia and Joe, we all sat and we watched Heavenly Creatures. And this, the thing that really blew my mind was that my daughter really did look, does look like me when I was <laughs> that age, which I hadn't noticed at all. But Peter kept l turning to me and saying, no, this is a bloody good film. This is a really <laughs> bloody good film we made. I mean, bloody hell, you know, when you think about some of the shit that's out there, Christ, this is a really good film. <laughs> I was like, sorry, calm down, Pete, calm down. And, and he suddenly had a moment of allowing himself, I think, beyond Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and all that, to just be very, very proud of a film that he'd made, this tiny film that we'd made 25 years ago. And that was, of course, the first thing I ever did. Um, and so I think that Peter would say that Heavenly Creatures was overlooked, but I'm not sure I can say that about anything I've done. No, I actually watched watch it again, and for some reason YouTube has the murder scene all over it. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, I guess it's popular. Um, but see, that's where. <laughs> see that. The, but that's very where cathartic I, to watch that scene for some. <laughs> watch people, the murder scene. Right. But when I hear when I hear that Madam Madam Butterfly track though that plays yeah. over that sequence at the end, yeah. I just I have to stop whatever I'm doing because it takes me right back to filming that scene, which I remember like yesterday. Um, but that you see, you know, people often say, "So is it luck or is it hard work?" You know, uh, come on, it's it's a hard work. It's hard work, and I, and I. I always say, well, of course it is. It is very hard. But 
there was this one huge stroke of luck for me, and that was Heavenly Creatures, because I'd never auditioned for a film, and it was that film, and it was that story, and it was that script, and it was that director, and it was that experience, and it did well. And you know, you hear stories, I mean, so many actors, my God, so many actors I know, you know, they spend eight, nine movies doing things that they just get tiny roles in and they play the pizza boy or the, you know, the girl next door with the annoying dog, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and those things, and they go straight to video or they'll do commercials forever and then suddenly at the age of 29, you know, they'll get their break. And that happened to me at 17 and that was luck. That was luck. Well, we are all very lucky that you had that stroke <laughs> <laughs> of luck. Um, I, I mean, going back to that time period, it kind of makes me wonder, I mean, at that time, did you have any uh, actors or stars you kind of looked to or looked, looked up to as, as a model in, in some way? Because I feel like now, as, as, a, as a star, you, you just have a, the, the kind of presence that makes you want to see the movie, no matter wh you know, who else is in it or what the you know, direction is about it. Um, I mean, oh my God, thank God. <laughs> 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 that is a relief because you know even when I walked in here I said is it full do they did they did, did they sell all the tickets <laughs> you still really get that that feeling doesn't go away it do, it really doesn't go away thank thank god you know um sorry you were about to but, ask but, me something. but I mean like at, at that stage at, at, at that stage you know did you have a particular actor or star that you, you looked up to yes at, I did yeah. Jodie Foster ah, okay. yes so I absolutely did. I just thought, because, because she'd been to Lula, you know, because, and I mean, because she had been acting as a child in front of my eyes as a child, I thought, oh my God, that's so it does happen, that thing. Like you really can be a young, a young actor in films. But I never thought that it would really happen. I never ever thought that. I, it was definitely just a sort of a fantasy. Um, and then I met Jodie when I was 19 at the Golden Globes and I went up to her and I told her that, she, that I had looked up to her for so many years and she was really, really ni nice and, and sweet. And then, I w and then I worked with her years later and, you know, and I'd say to her every day, I'd say, don't disappoint me now. <laughs> <laughs> every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're my girl. Yeah. Don't let me down. <laughs> Shut up, she'd say. <laughs> Um, and I mean, Heavenly Creatures is such an interesting movie to start with as a feature debut, just because it, I mean, that's another movie where you're doing so much that, you know, Peter Jackson always has this whole range of, of genres within one movie that he can do. Um, and one thing I found interesting about your career is that you, you will embrace the bigger movies, obviously the biggest, <laughs> what is one of them, but, but also adventure kind of films. Um, and like, for example, you're going to be doing Avatar. Um, yes. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> um, I mean, how is it different doing those sort of movies? Do you have to think of it uh, as in a different way? Because those movies are very, they're bodily in a different way. Um, uh, you know, it's in Wonder Wheel, one thing I was thinking about is the way you use your breathing in the movie um, and you punctuate things with that. And I'm just curious in an action film, if you even have time for that or an adventure film, you even have how much time you have for that sort of thing. No, there is still the time. There's absolutely, I mean, there has to be. Otherwise you just sort of don't do it properly. Or well, certainly I wouldn't do it properly um but but you know bigger films are they are different um you know sometimes they're not it's it's i love doing small films i love it because you get to really get to know everyone you know you get to know the names of people's wives and husbands and children and how they're doing oh wow the school plays today oh my god well they're gonna are, they, are we gonna finish in time you're gonna be able to you know those are the relationships that mean the most to me and those are the relationships that you can really find establish and keep by and large on the smaller films and on bigger films there's just so many people so we always find it actually a bit upsetting if i don't know who everyone's name is just because there's so many of them um but the sort of the process of what acting actually is, it is very much the same. Although, you know, often I'd say maybe on big films there are, you know, you might end up just doing lots more takes because there are more people in the scene or there's th there's just more stuff to coordinate. Um, in terms of Avatar though, my understanding from what Jim Cameron has told me um, is that, so performance capture, you really don't do it over and over again. You rehearse and then you you decide the version of the scene that best suits the character in the moment and then you shoot that and you shoot it once or twice until you feel you've really got it great and then he extracts 
all the shots that he needs from one shot. I mean, I still, I, I still don't really understand how it all works, but I'm very excited to, um, I'm very, very excited to to learn something new. I mean, it really is learning a whole new other skill. Yeah. I, I, can you tell us anything about the character at all, or what? What is it? No. Anim animal vegetable. I'm not mineral? allowed. No, okay. <laughs> um, but I do play. I can tell you that I, um, I do play. I'm just wondering what I am allowed to say. I do play. Burn oh the no, tapes she's shaking her head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean to cross the line. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not really able to say anything. That's but it's yeah. it's a it's a pivotal role, yeah. and actually, in reality, I only have a, about a month on mm. the whole mm. the whole of all of it. I I only really have just about a month. Yeah. There's n there's no way my life would pull off me being able to <laughs> do <laughs> two Avatar films. No, sure, sure, yeah. that wouldn't be possible. But yeah, so so I'm I'm really very very excited about it. Yeah, um, and th then just kind of one other general career question I, I was wondering uh would, would you consider any sort of television or episodic sort of thing like that yes yes my god the scandinavians are getting it right okay and the brits um <laughs> <laughs> but i i mean i i i have to say that 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 i do think that that in the last five to ten years television has just completely transformed it's Every, everyone and anyone is doing it. You know, there's none of that that stuff of you know. Well, as a film actor, and doesn't it looks weird that they're suddenly doing television? You know, all of that's gone. That's all gone away. Um, and and yes, I, I I and I love I love television. I really do. Great writers, and it still feels the same as making a film. There's really no difference at all. Um, it's still the same length of shooting day, same length of actual shoot. And that idea as well that you can tell more story because you've got more time. And we had that on Mildred because it was five full hours. So we didn't cut anything out of that book. It was all in there. And that's really thrilling when you don't have to, you know, trim the important edges off. Um, and so I would love to do more television. Yeah, yeah I really, really would. Um, and uh, you actually started out doing smaller parts in television, is that right? Or I did, yes, yeah. yes, I did. So I did a sitcom when I was about fifteen, um, uh, with Ray Winston, and <laughs> he played my dad. Um, and yeah, when I was fifteen, we did two series. When I was fifteen, when I was sixteen, and I did a, ki a kids um, TV drama as well when I was fifteen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was trying to hunt down, hunt those down, when I couldn't quite <laughs> couldn't quite find them. Yeah, my s my son was actually asking me about it the other day. Yeah. He said, so "What did you look like when you were 15? I said, "Oh my god," and he was asking about the jobs that I had done. Then he said, "God, mum, you were you were working when you were basically nearly my age. You were really working." I said, "Yeah, I was." He said, "But what did your parents think?" I said, "My God, what was that with these questions?" <laughs> um, and uh, I said, well, they were absolutely thrilled. He said, yeah, but you, you just must have been so grown up. And that's the thing. I actually was quite grown up for my age, at that young age, for some reason. I don't really know why. Um, I mean, my parents were brilliant, and they, they gave us a lot of sort of freedom and trust and independence and things like that. And that definitely helped in terms of me feeling self-sufficient, which I've always really felt. Um, and, and, and enjoy that. You know, I find that a very sort of empowering feeling. Um, and 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 I and I do carry that feeling actually into into the job into into the work. So, so I really don't like having lots of people around. Mm -hmm. So often, you know, um, you know, you might see actors who have an assistant on set all the time, which is very commonplace, extremely normal. And sometimes for some people, it's absolutely necessary. I hate it. I could not bear to have somebody following me around like that. I just, for me, that's my time. That's my my private little crazy world that we exist in for that for that short time and uh and i i really you know i cherish it i really really cherish it yeah, yeah. well it i mean it i know, I know for, for some act for some actors having started acting that that early you know often you feel like you missed out on childhood but it feels like you've just kind of channeled that kind of energy all throughout like, like youthful energy in the roles that you do even to, to this day yeah i do i mean i still you know, I I turned forty two a couple of weeks ago, and I'm so shocked. <laughs> like, oh my God, really? That's I'm really forty two. How's that happened? I mean, I know everyone feels like that, <laughs> um, but but no, I do. Um, I do feel in some ways that I l a little bit mi missed out, um, a tiny bit. Partly, I think because, you know, I think that sort of period of experimenting, just in terms of life, really. You know, thinking about maybe other things that you want to do. Um, you know having a boyfriend 
and maybe not having that boyfriend anymore and maybe going traveling for a year and then maybe having a different boyfriend. And I just didn't do that stuff. I didn't because I was working. Um, and don't get me wrong, I had an absolutely amazing time and had a lovely boyfriend actually for <laughs> sort of four years straight, but it was always very grown up. You know, I was always, ha I was, I had to be self-sufficient and mature from quite a young age, I think because of the good fortune that was coming my way in, ter in terms of work. Um, so, the, and, and I do say to, you know, to my kids now, I'll say, you know, it's really, really important. You know, you can get your head down and you can work as much as you like, but it's very, we will make sure that you have great adventures. Um, because I do, I, I, I do recognize that I, I, I miss that little bit. Um, well, I think we're coming to the end of our, our time uh, here. Um, so I just want to thank you again for, for coming. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see you all at uh, Wonder Wheel tomorrow. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And